Hello, we're telling our stories, meaning making, with the conviction that you're a story too. Uh, my name's Andy Griffiths. And my name's Imogen Ney. And this is the third in a series of conversations about making meaning. Um, so here's what Imogen and I are hoping. We're really hoping that if we tell the story of lockdown and emergence and kind of tease out the shape of that story for us, maybe that will help some other people to tell their stories too. Absolutely. And uh, in this third conversation, we're looking at some biblical models, aren't we, Andy? And um, the first one, which has been quite a dominant model in conversations, in religious conversations about lockdown, has been the theme of exile and return. Um, about 600 years before the time of uh, Jesus, the people of Judah, or at least some of them, were taken away from their land and also from the temple and were forced migrants in the Babylonian Empire for about 70 years. Um, Andy, you'll remember the song, By the Waters of Babylon, where we set, sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Yeah, and, and thank you for not singing it. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, well, it's really obvious, isn't it, why so many Christians found this exile theme resonating with their experience. They were locked out of their sacred buildings, the thin places that meant so much to them. Um, and it was really painful for people to not be able to go into their churches, particularly for a lot of priests. Uh, and for them, when the Archbishop of Canterbury presided at his kitchen table for communion, um, for some this was an outrage. It seemed to be a domestic mockery of the holy. They were determined to be like the Israelites in Babylon, caring about and working for the prosperity of the place they were living. But like Jeremiah, they saw the importance of lamenting really well. Um, but like Daniel, they didn't want to give up their habits of daily prayer. Away from the temple, it seemed impossible for them to be praying and worshipping, not in their temples. And so they longed to be home. Yeah. Uh, and I see the point of that. And I, I, I think the people that were speaking about that were right that, lament was an appropriate thing it was like a bereavement for a lot of people losing their church buildings and it really didn't help when some other people told them they shouldn't be feeling like that because because when you're bereaved you you feel like you feel and you feel the denial and the anger and the numbness and the guilt and all of those things that bereaved people always feel, so you should be lamenting. Uh, and Tom Wright and Angela Tilby were two high profile Christian leaders who told the story this way as a story of exile. And Angela Tilby, in particular, felt that there was something. Um, particularly in Congress, about trying to do what is holy in a place that is not a thin place, a, a place hallowed by prayer, a, a sacred building. And then there was another group of Christians, and they started telling an alternative version of the story. Uh, they were largely disabled Christians including the Twitter collective Disability in Jesus, though there were some feminists as well that were saying some similar things, I remember. Because for them, lockdown wasn't an exile, but an exodus. Um, the way they told the story, they'd been longing for God to come and deliver his people, setting them free from dependence on church buildings church buildings that for so long had excluded the differently abled and had privileged the male. 
So, when Archbishop Justin presided at communion from his kitchen table, for, for them it felt like the church coming home. But for them it almost, not quite, but almost felt like a new incarnation. Uh, and when some of Archbishop Justin's opponents or critics started saying he was being all domestic, like that was a bad thing, or, or he was criticized for insisting that priests should work from home whenever possible. Some of those people who were telling an Exodus story pointed out that the Israelites in the desert moaned against their leaders too. And one rather famous tweet at that time uh, even said, remember in the desert what the Israelites did was moan against their leaders and God sent snakes. Yes, uh, uh, I've got a lot of sympathy with that, um, Andy. And it was very funny then because my son just popped in. I don't know if you all noticed, but that's been a feature of lockdown, hasn't it? Children popping in to Zoom meetings and broadcasts and, and journalists interviewing people. Um, and I'm very comfortable with that domestic zone. And I suppose I, I resonate with the feminists. I felt God was doing a new thing and it was really, really exciting and um, incredibly powerful to be able to celebrate communion in my own home and live stream that to people. It felt that uh, God was really, um, really telling us something about who we were or who we hadn't been and how God had been trapped for me um, in, in our religious buildings and he was somehow being set free. And I found that very much leading um, worship from my home live streaming that God was suddenly set free to be in different places. Um, but I know that that's a counter story that as you were describing for others, it was deeply painful. Um, but as we talk, you mentioned the word emergence there, Andy, and I find that quite a difficult word because um, I don't like, for me, the emergence suggests that we've been hiding away and we're sort of slowly being able to see things. Whereas the time as being a time of creativity and growth um, is, is how I've experienced it. And so I'm not emerging into, into the world, but I actually want to be a co-creator of a new reality that reflects more deeply the kingdom of heaven. But I wonder which model you prefer. Do you uh, resonate with exile or not? So I think I prefer a third model, neither Exodus nor exile, but Abraham and Sarai, or they became Abraham and Sarah. So, so here's this third version of the story. In Exodus chapter 11, the people try to build a tower to reach up and make a name for themselves. And they get disorganized and scattered and humbled. And God starts again, putting the world to rights. And how does God do that? Well, oddly enough, he does it through a household led by Abraham and Sarah. And he says to them, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing. And it really, really isn't that God didn't love everyone. It's just that he chose one representative household wandering in the wilderness to be a creative minority for the sake of everyone else. And through that minority, he would change the world. I mean, I'm really aware that in some parishes at the moment, a few people get tickets for a physical service of worship and the majority watch online. And I'm really hoping that the people who get tickets don't feel like they're some sort of elite, like they got tickets for Hamilton. Using the picture of Abraham and Sarah as God's new people, God's creative minority. I'm, I'm wondering if 
those who worship together physically in a parish at the moment could see themselves as representing the majority. They're being blessed so that the whole community can be blessed through them. I really like that idea. But what counts is how do you tell the story? And we'll be sharing another meaning making conversation soon. So do watch this space for our first meaning making live, which we're not quite sure how we'll go. But we want to invite you to tell your stories, to have conversations and to share and shape how we talk about lockdown and emergence. So thank you so much for listening.